I don't want no oil A spoil in my shoreline I like fish much better than crud I like birds and things A creeping and crawling Won't trade no more oil for blood The sun don't give us all we need To make this country run but that black demon oil's got us fussing and fighting And I do believe it's time we was done I don't want them nukes run by them kooks Who think radioactivity is fun No more three-headed frogs or kids with leukemia Nuclear power ain't fit for a dog The sun don't give us all we need To make this country run But that nuclear power's got us fussing and fighting And I do believe it's time we was done No news! Good morning, Toledo, and good afternoon, Columbus, and hello to everyone in Bowling Green or listening on the internet, wherever or whenever you may be. My name is Joseph D. DeMar, and I'm here with my semi-nomadic co-host, Rebecca Wood. For the next hour, Rebecca and I will be creating a one-of-a-kind program called For a Green Future. For a Green Future is a show where we talk about ecology and the environment, and we talk about them in the ways that they affect you, your wealth, your health, your happiness, and the wealth and health of, and happiness of your friends and family, and the health of everyone in all the kingdoms of the earth, animal, plant, archaebacteria, oibacteria, eu bacteria, monera, fungi, and protista, because despite Elon Musk's fantasies, there's no escaping it. We're all stuck to here with each other on this rapidly destabilizing planet called Earth. But we're not going to get let a little thing like our collapsing biosphere keep us from bringing you an excellent show. Actually, or sadly, documenting the collapse of the planet does make very gripping programming. And if you find yourself so enthralled with our narrative, this is as good a time as any to remind you how you can give your feedback about this show. One way is to call or text 419-973-5841. Another is to send an email to joe at joedemar for a green There's another way to contact us. We haven't mentioned that often. For a Green Future has both a Facebook page and a Facebook group. If you're on Facebook, you can leave us a message there. We post links on our page to the podcast and YouTube versions of the show each week as soon as they're uploaded. So it's another method of listening to our show online. However you choose to get in touch, we'd like to ask you a question this week. How are you holding up? How are you dealing with all the apocalyptic news about the environment lately? What are your coping mechanisms? If we receive any great responses, we'll read them on the air next week. So there's no doubt that for us here on For a Green Future, being able to do this show is part of our coping mechanism. For the next, for the next 15 minutes or so, we're going to chat for a bit, and then we have a bit of a celebration. Our guest this week is Tim Judson from the Nuclear Information Resource Service, or NEARS. NEARS is celebrating 45 years of fighting the nuclear industry. Wait a minute, what happened to, what is it, Helen? Is she the one we always have from NEARS? Yes, but okay. this week is Tim Judson, the executive director, in fact. Over the decades, they've had incredible successes battling some of the biggest, most powerful, and evilest corporations and forces on the planet. After that interview comes messages from our sponsors and patrons. Then it will be time for Rebecca to take an in-depth look at something environmentally related. Rebecca, what will you be talking about this week? I, I will be talking about uh, Stuffed Green Bell Peppers Day. 
an entire day yes. dedicated coming up to, to Sunday. Yeah, it's this pretty exciting. <laughs> that does sound exciting. <laughs> After we hear from Rebecca, we have some ecological news from around the world. It's not all doom and gloom. There's some very good news too, and some promising stories about technologies that may yet save our society. Firstly, we have a short update on the Canadian wildfires. Canada has finally updated its National Wildlands Fire Report back on the 16th. At that time, there were still about 630 fires, with 220 of them being out of control. Oy. Yeah. We know that more and more communities are now being threatened and evacuated. That's especially true in British Columbia, where 35,000 people were under evacuation orders. Smoke from the Canadian wildfires made the air in Seattle, Washington, the most polluted in the world back on August 23rd. Wow. Cooler weather is expected this week, so we'll see if the situation finally settles down. There have been six deaths so far reported. So, this week we'd like to talk about a developing situation in Troy Township, Ohio. That's the unincorporated areas a bit east of the line between Bowling Green and Toledo. Back on August 16th, one of our intrepid reporters spotted a legal notice in the Bowling Green Sentinel Tribune. Troy Township trustees are having a public hearing on August 28th dealing with zoning changes in regards to solar power. That caught our interest because we've noticed a trend in about a dozen towns around Ohio, being that solar po power development and projects has been banned. This is a result of a state law recently passed allowing local authorities to ban wind and solar. The code 303.213 doesn't grant authority authority to ban any other sort of energy infrastructure, be that fracking, coal plants, or electrical substations. Any or all of those projects can be built over local objections, but wind and solar can have this arbitrary restriction imposed on them. Really, Ohio, if you're going to ban something, how about the giant factory farms that make the water in Bowling Green so bad that we, it's, it's undrinkable like a couple months of the year? Yeah, we have so much open space. We've got to figure out something else to do with it other than and, just... And frankly, it doesn't taste that great even not outside of that month sometimes, <laughs> <laughs> as I recall. The public notice in the paper said that the proposed changes were available for review at the Fire EMS building in Lucky, Ohio. So our necessarily nameless reporter got in his wonder van and drove out to Lucky. He found the EMS building empty, ringing and knocking, and got no response. There was, however, a phone number on a bulletin board for Laura Binnicker, the financial officer for the township. Our reporter called several times trying to set up a time to view the documents, but received no response. We still have not heard back from them. However, acting on a hunch, several days later he drove back to the EMS building, and with the help of a few EMS personnel who just happened to be there at that time, discovered that the proposed changes had been left out in a hallway, on a table, with no notice and no labeling or signage. The subsequent examination of Zoning Resolution A2-2023 confirmed our worst fears. The resolution bans what are called the principal solar energy systems and small solar facilities. The definition they use of small solar facilities are defined simply as solar panels and associated facilities with a single interconnection to the electrical grid and designed for or capable of operation at an aggregate capacity of less than 50 megawatts. So we were talking about people's houses then? Yeah, the language perfectly describes oh most homes. How does this impact systems. anyone? Anyone? Yeah, In everyone. the community, other than the homeowner. Exactly. The zoning code itself is contradictory because it does say that roof mounted and freestanding panels are permissible sometimes on a conditional basis with a bunch of unnecessary restrictions, even though roof mounted and freestanding installations would meet the definition of smaller solar facilities, 
which are banned. But the confusing and contradicting regulations don't change the fundamental fact that no one should be banning solar panels right now, anywhere in any form. Wind and solar power are our best bet for getting out of the death spiral our planet is locked into right now. As we've said, we're stuck in a what, Rebecca? Puzzle feedback loop! Boo! Ooh. Actually, well, they're not boo. good. <laughs> they're really not good. I don't know why I'm cheering. <laughs> There's only two ways to get out of a positive feedback loop. One is to stay in it until the effects are so amplified that the system crashes. That's what happens when you have a positive feedback loop in a sound system, where the mic sound is amplified through the speakers and then back through the microphone until you get that deafening screech. We try to avoid that. <laughs> yeah, if you let that sound continue, eventually the speakers will rip, blow out, the system will collapse, and the screech will stop. The other way to get out of a positive feedback loop is to turn off the input. That is, we turn off the mic before the speakers blow. In terms of global warming, that means stopping the carbon dioxide we're still spewing into the air. Every solar installation helps with this, and banning solar projects at this point is approaching suicidal. However, it's happening in township after township all over Ohio. Compared to the alternative motivations, we'd like to think people are just being misled. The propaganda put out by the fossil fuel industry says things like, solar panels leach toxic chemicals into the ground. But, of course, solar panels are sealed against the weather. The glass and the aluminum frame prevents any of the chemicals used to make the actual solar cells from getting out. It is a near impossibility that solar panels release any kind of chemical during their entire 25-year lifespan. lifespan. Even at the end of their lifespan, they can be recycled. First Solar has a recycling program with some plants located in Ohio, and uranium cannot, not, 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 not. Never can. Seriously, no. Regardless of what you hear, very bad idea. Right. Uh, solar panels, you can recover more than 90% of the materials used in their manufacture. But that's another oft spread rumor is that solar panels will change storm runoff patterns or otherwise harm the land used for the. Uh, you harm the land used for the installations or that land located nearby. But those are just lies of the many that are being used to turn people against solar in rural areas of Ohio. And of all the horrible, horrible things we do that, that just viciously harm the planet, this is the one they're going for? It's like when you, when you level an entire mountain to get coal, ever so slightly damaging to the land. Yeah. You know? <laughs> Leaving huge holes. Well, yes. these, these are just perpetuated by anti-solar groups with intentionally confusing agendas, such as spreading responsible solar practices. Yeah, yeah. make no mistake, virtually all of those anti-solar groups have ties to fossil fuels. Yeah. As a result, those bad actors, or the public they've misled, push their local boards to ban solar, and all too often the governing bodies comply. But let's zoom out and look at the larger picture for a moment. One of the most poignant stories to come out of the 9-11 disaster was a group of people who found themselves in the emergency stairwell above the floors that were burning. They quickly had to decide whether to go up the stairs or down the stairs past the flames. Some of the people who did not want to go past the fire argued that they should all go up because then they could be rescued by helicopters. The rest went down past the flames, and even though they suffered some burns and smoke inhalation, they survived. Of course, it's impossible for a helicopter to land on a burning skyscraper, let alone carry people off of it, as the heat from the skyscrapers would form its own weather pattern directly above them building. And it would be rough and rowdy. <laughs> yes. Okay. Okay. So all of the people who were hoping for a rooftop rescue, unfortunately, did not make it. 
In a similar way, it's impossible for our society to continue to function, that is, to continue to supply us with food, water, and shelter in a world with a runaway greenhouse effect. Crops will fail, and grids will be destroyed faster than they can be rebuilt. Temperatures will continue to climb until something critical fails. It's nice to imagine we could continue business as usual, just as it's nice to imagine being rescued from a burning building by a helicopter, but it's literally impossible. The people pushing for these zoning changes that ban solar facilities are like those who told everyone to go up the stairs in the burning building. They are doing exactly the wrong thing at the wrong time. Well, you know, I think that there was less access that they had to information that that was the wrong thing to do in the burning building. That's true. We, we have ample in, access to the, uh, to the fact that this is really, really the wrong thing to do. We're just not listening. In any situation, yeah, some people are going to make the wrong decisions. But when those people have the power and authority of government, they are forcing us, the citizens, into the same fate. There's no exit from this building or this planet. Yeah, boy. It's as if the people heading upstairs also had the only key that would open the doors <laughs> at the bottom of the stairs. Yeah, kind of. We've all got to get on the pa same page in this struggle right now. Not in a few years, but now. Another choice we can't make in dealing with global warming is to turn to nuclear power. To stretch our burning skyscraper analogy a little further, trying to escape Global warming with nuclear energy is like thinking if you just wait where you are, eventually the fire will go out and you'll be okay. The most duplicitous proponents of nuclear solutions on the internet today are actually blaming global warming on the anti-nuclear movement. They argue that if they had been able to build the thousands of nuclear plants they wanted back in the 1970s, there would have been no changes in climate today. Uh, I think there would have been. <laughs> Yeah, well... Because they, they let off a lot of hot water, for starters. Coal usage would have been a lot less, but that's the only factor I can think of. They blame the fact that nuke plants were stopped solely on the anti-nuclear activists of the time. But that view is blatantly false for many reasons. Not that they would have done anything wrong even if it was true. <laughs> yes. Activists are an oft-maligned group, for sure. Uh, one reason it's false is that it conveniently forgets nuclear power's history of catastrophic failures. After each catastrophe, whether Three Mile Island, Chernobyl, or Fukushima, or others, orders for nuclear power plants are cancelled as the power company executives realize again that they're terribly dangerous and unreliable sources of power. There's also the economics. Nuclear power is the most expensive form of energy ever commercialized. Unlike other sources, wind and solar, nukes continue to be more and more expensive as the years go by. The process of extracting energy from nuclear is incredibly complicated. After each accident or near disaster, new regulations are proposed to protect future reactors. While this is sound policy, it also increases the cost of each plant until where we find ourselves today, the Vogtel. The Vogtel plants in Georgia are literally the most expensive power plants ever built in human history. More than $30 billion. It's cheaper to do things uh, badly and dangerously. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's the, the cost-risk analysis. Right. You know, <laughs> There's no doubt, though, that citizen opposition has prevented some plants from being built, led to others being closed earlier, and prevented many nuclear waste dumps from being created. Those aren't the acts of climate terrorists. Those are the acts of people trying to protect their homes and their loved ones from the dangers of radiation. Who uh, terrorized them, people, mostly by voting? Yes. Voting, uh, engaging uh, holding in the little signs, process. yeah, maybe lobbying, writing letters, yeah, it's terrifying. Nuclear power has never been necessary. Today it produces less than 10% of the world's energy, less than a third of the power that is wasted by things like empty parking lots that are lit continually, 
or computers that are left running all the time. Creating these wastes that will poison our descendants for 200,000 years so that we can leave the lights on when we leave the room is immoral, and fighting nukes is part of a heroic struggle against those that think they know better. One of the most successful organizations involved in the battle of, against nukes is NEARS, the Nuclear Information Resource Service. This year, NEARS is celebrating its celebrating its 45th anniversary, and we are honored to have Tim Judson, Executive Director at NEARS, give us an interview where we look back at some of NEARS' successes and look ahead to what remains to be done. Hello, and welcome to For a Green Future. Could, could you please share with us your name and position? Sure, yeah, my name is uh, Tim Judson, and I'm the Executive Director at the Nuclear Information and Resource Service. All right. Well, first of all, congratulations on your 45th year anniversary since the founding of NEARS. You oh, thanks so much. Must be very proud. Yeah, I think that I think that everyone is I think everyone's really proud. Um, you know, it's 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 a 45th anniversary. It's not exactly, um, you know, <clears throat> one of the most typical ones that you celebrate, but, um, you know, we'll take it as it comes. <laughs> and, so, you know, what we're saying is that, um, you know, the, uh, you know, the 45th anniversary is typically the Sapphire anniversary and Nears is a real gem. So here we are. <laughs> That's nice. So let's start with the basic basics. Uh, who founded Nears and when was it created exactly? What's the purpose of your organization? Sure. Yeah. Nears was founded in 1978, um, initially uh, with the support of um, uh, someone named Stanley Weiss, who was, a, you know, someone who was helping to support social movement organizations, you know, back in the 1970s. Um, and we opened our doors on September 16th, 1978. And so the actual 45th anniversary is coming up in a, in a few weeks. And, and, and so we were established, um, you know, to basically be kind of a, a national support organization for the grassroots movement. So working with grassroots groups around the country, you know, this was, you know, obviously pre-internet. And so there was a real need for there to be um, some sort of an information and networking hub, um, you know, for the grassroots movement to have access to information, you know, to, to reliable, accurate information about nuclear energy, right. um, to have right. access to things like technical experts and, um, and you know, and, and, and public speakers and documents and reports and those sort of things, um, you know, and so that's, that's really the, 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 the role that NEARS kind of started playing 45 years ago. We continue to do that to this day. Um, you know, but we also um, help coordinate national campaigns, working with grassroots groups and coalitions, um, and we say we kind of we kind of serve as the you know Washington D.C. outpost of the grassroots you know anti-nuclear movement. So you're the current executive producer, but you're not the first, of course. You haven't been with them since the beginning. Could you Correct, tell us yeah. a little bit more about your predecessors? Sure. Yeah. Um, so Nears, yeah, Nears has been around for 45 years. Um, I I joined Nears 10 years ago, actually on September 16th, uh, 2013, and so my 10th anniversary is coming up. Yeah. And, and you know, but, but yeah, but my my predecessor was um, was you know sort of a historic figure in the movement himself uh, named Michael Marriott, who had been the executive director for um, you know 27 years before I came around. Um, and he unfortunately you know, died of cancer in 2016 and, um, you know, but had also started, a, you know, a really, a really amazing blog that ran for a couple of years, the last couple of years before he died called Green World, which you can still find on our website. It was really documenting, um, you know, the, the pivotal moment of the transition to green energy, you know, with with the way that renewables were starting to explode around around the mid 2010s. Right. Uh, right. But, you know, far from far from the only, you know, we've you know, we've got, um, you know, Diane DeRigo, who's still on our staff, has been on has been at NEARS for 37 years at this point um, and or no, sorry, 30, 32 years at this. Point. Anyway, almost almost 40 years. <laughs> um, Diane has been on staff and she, you know, has, um, you know, done an incredible amount of work. Um, and then we've had other, you know, other notable people, you know, on our board, such as. Um, the amazing indigenous activist Grace Thorpe, um, and uh, you know we've had some celebrities like you know like uh, an artist like Bonnie Raitt and Whoopi Goldberg on our board at times. We've had we've had brilliant scientists like Judith Johnsrud and Rosalie Bertel, 
Um, and then, you know, other other sort of movement leaders, um, you know, like um, Elizabeth May, the um, the the former executive director of the Sierra Club of Canada and the head of the Green Party in Canada. Wow. Uh, you all have been involved with some incredible battles over those decades that all of your uh, members have been a part of. Could you give us the highlights of some of your struggles? Sure. Yeah. I mean, we, you know, we were involved with, um, you know, helping work with grassroots campaigns and, you know, from, from the get go, um, like in the 1980s, when um, the people of Sacramento, California, d um, shut down the Rancho Seco reactor by public referendum. Um, we had been involved in that, you know, um, with, with, with the community for a long time. Um, we also had one of our most historic victories um, was the defeat of what we call the mobile Chernobyl bill, um, in you know in Congress in uh, in in the 1990s, which would have essentially you know sort of set up a national nuclear waste transportation scheme um, to ship all of the nuclear waste in the country um, to Yucca Mountain in Nevada, and um, right. and in, and through grassroots organizing, we got President Clinton to veto that bill, and then we sustained um, the veto in the Senate um, and prevented that legislation from happening. But we've done lots of you know we've had lots of other things. You know we we stopped repeatedly. Um, the NR, the Nuclear Regulatory Commission and Congress from deregulating radioactive waste and allowing it to be recycled into, into consumer products and dumped in landfills. Um, you know, we, we organized with grassroots groups to oppose every single nuclear reactor that was proposed in the nuclear, with the so-called nuclear renaissance. And that was, and, and, and that wave of nuclear construction was defeated. Um, and we've done things, you know, on a, on a smaller scale, but equally significant, such as keeping nuclear power out of President Obama's clean power plan. Uh, good effort, for sure. Uh, the public might associate you with stopping nuclear power plants, but you've also been involved with stopping nuclear waste dumps, too, right? That's right. Yeah. In fact, um, you know, we counted it up a few years ago because you, know, you don't always take you always you don't always take account of your victories. Yeah. But um, but we've been involved in um, stopping a set of, uh, over 75 radioactive waste dumps around the country since the 1980s. Wow. And people may not remember this because, you know, it was a long time ago, but there was a wave of of uh, proposals to build radio to, to site radioactive waste dumps in dozens of states across the country. And um, and and so we were and so we were, you know, we were working with communities to help them fight those. And, you know, but we've also stopped bigger things like, you know, help stop bigger things like the Yucca Mountain nuclear waste dump proposed for Nevada um, and others as well. So what is be an exaggeration to say that millions of people have been spared from radiation exposure due to the efforts of your group. I wouldn't. I wouldn't say NIRS is responsible for that, but certainly it's true that you know that um, that millions of people have been protected by the work of this movement that we you know, that we're that we're so proud to you know to be a part of. The uh, the latest smear against anti nuclear organizations from pro nukers on social media right now is the claim that you folks have tons of money many times more than pro uh nuclear pro nuclear groups is that mm -hmm. as ridiculous as it seems i mean i wish it were true but you know but yeah <laughs> it clearly isn't i mean this is this is this is the sort of this is the same sort of thing that we've seen really kind of ratchet up you know since uh you know since the trump administration which is you know people you know um, you know um you know propagandists um you know essentially accusing you know the people that they want to attack of doing the of, of doing the thing that they do and you know the truth is that you know that the nuclear industry um, is incredibly is incredibly wealthy and powerful. I mean, you know, y'all in you know, in Ohio saw you know have have experienced this firsthand with the with the first energy sixty million dollar you know bribery and corruption scandal. Absolutely. And you know, and then the same thing is you know the thing the same thing has been true across the country. You know the you know the Exelon the 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 utility in Illinois has been you know being tried on uh, similar or has been accused of similar. Um, acts of corruption is what First Energy engaged in. Um, and, you know, what we saw happen just in the last two years with Congress is, um, you know, um, with the, the, you know, the the legislation that got that's gotten passed over the last, you know, in 2021 and 2022, the bipartisan infrastructure bill and the Inflation Reduction Act. Together, those two pieces of legislation can you know have you know somewhere upwards of potentially a hundred and hundred billion dollars in subsidy <laughs> and incentives for nuclear energy, um, and you know when you look at and, and, and even just looking at you know at the lobbying records, 
the nuclear industry spent um, over $180 million in those two years lobbying the federal government. Um, and so, you know, if, you know, if you've ever, you know, the, the, it's, you know the, the, the amount of money that they and resources that they have and they do spend on lobbying and politics and dark money operations and front groups and PR is just staggering. And, um, and the fact that the, the anti-nuclear movement um, has, you know, held this industry back as well as we have is a testament, you know, to really the power of the grassroots movement. And, and the fact that people, when it comes right down to it, you know, know that nuclear power is bad and they don't want it. Yeah, if only we had access to hundreds of billions of dollars. So what are these struggles that your group is involved in fighting right now? Sure. Well, there's there's a number of them. First of all, there there's another wave of proposals for you know for for new for building new reactors. Um, you know, the industry is coming back again with um, you know trying to paint itself as you know the world's greatest climate solution when it's you know when it's you know when it's actually nothing of the sort. Um, so there's a number of new reactors that have been proposed, mostly actually in the western part of the U.S., where there isn't very much nuclear power today. Um, we're also really fighting hard to stop uh, what's called consolidated interim storage of nuclear waste. This is the industry's continued attempt to start transporting the nuclear waste at the reactor sites all across the country to um, to uh, to um, to dump it in environmental justice communities in the southwest now. Um, we're also working with communities, especially in New York and Massachusetts, to stop um, the wholesale dumping of radioactive water into the Hudson River and, and Cape Cod Bay. Yes. Um, you know, as part of the decommissioning of these of, of reactors that have closed down. And the thing that's amazing that's coming out in this, because, you know, the industry really has no way to defend itself for just, you know, dumping radioactive waste into into our waterways, um, you know, is that they've been basically been pointing the finger um, saying you know, that, 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 that re nuclear reactors dump radioactive waste in the rivers and the lakes and the oceans all the time, which is absolutely true. Um, but this one company, Holtec, that's that's trying to do this, trying to get away with this in Massachusetts and New York, um, has tried to defend itself by pointing out the obvious, which is that every nuclear reactor, you know, in the world is constantly leaking and dumping radioactive waste as part of their normal operations. And I think that, you know, that we need to really, you know, sort of take that seriously, that it isn't just, you know, at the end of when a nuclear reactor starts, starts you know, stops operating, that you got to deal with the waste. We're constantly being affected by the waste and by the uranium mining to, to make the fuel for the reactors and the whole nuclear fuel chain is is you know is an environmental disaster every single day. Right, and that's not something we should continue allowing. That's something we've been reporting on a little bit here already. Uh, could you take a look at he ahead and talk a little bit about where the battle against nuclear power might look? like in the future? Sure. Well, I think we're getting a really clear picture of it. And, you know, and unfortunately, some of this is because of all of this money that got, you know, that got put towards nuclear and the Inflation Reduction Act and the, you know, and the bipartisan infrastructure legislation. Um, you know, there is a tremendous number of proposals for nuclear power plants to be turned into factories for making hydrogen um, as, a, as an alternative energy supply. Um, you guys are seeing this, this actually in Ohio right now with, you um, this uh, pilot project that um, that uh, Energy Harbor is doing at the Davis Bessey reactor to produce hydrogen, and they have a proposal into the to, into the Department of Energy to create a regional hydrogen hub demonstration project. Um, you know, this is you know this nuclear and hydrogen scam is you know is just that. It's you know it's a way for the industry to soak up billions and billions of dollars in federal money for producing hydrogen. Um, you know, which is only going to, which is only going to, you know, further block renewable energy, and it's probably it would probably even lead to more fossil fuel. Gen you know, so we're seeing we're we're seeing battles like that coming up um, over really what the energy future of this country is going to look like, and the nuclear industry playing as it always has a really negative role in preventing um, the transition to renewable energy. Uh, we're going to see more pushes for for you know for public bailouts of you know these old nuclear reactors that are increasingly decrepit and and, and too expensive to operate. Um, we're going to have to be fighting these new reactor proposals that are coming up, you know, as this industry is really flailing and trying to trying to save itself. Um, and then there's and then there's sort of the you know kind of the real environmental issues around the nuclear waste crisis that we're facing with you know, these massive stockpiles of radioactive waste that have no solution. Um, we're gonna, we're seeing you know these old reactors you know, continuing to become more degraded and embrittled and you know and dangerous to operate, and that intersecting with 
um, with the dangers of climate disruption and you know the increasing storms and flooding and wildfires and all those things um, that could that could become an increasingly nu nuclear safety hazards. And then we've got um, this sort of looming issue of the, of the shutdown of this industry as as these reactors you know begin retiring um, in greater numbers because they're not sustainable to operate anymore. And the, and the decommissioning of these facilities, you know, potentially unleashing of, of the floodgates of radioactive waste um, as companies try to cut costs and, and dispose of the waste from, from their legacy of these operations, um, you know, as, as cheaply as they can. Well, we feel a little bit more confident that you'll be on the front lines fighting against that. Uh, back to the anniversary, what are you doing to celebrate? I understand you've got T-shirts available. Yeah, so we, yeah, we've got T-shirts available on our website. You can find a, you can find those if you go to nears.org or nirs.org. Um, there should be a banner at the front at the top of the website where you can find those. Um, we're going to be having a, you know, an online celebration in December. Um, you know, which you know we'll be letting folks know about and we'll be advertising. And then, you know, because for us, you know, the the work itself is a celebration, and so we're going to be. Um, you know, we're, we're working with grassroots groups to mobilize for this you know, for this uh, big climate march in September in New York City called the March to End Fossil Fuels. And we're right. and we're going to be having a nuclear free, carbon free contingent, our hub at the um, at, at the at that march. And um, it's going to be really fun and exciting. And so anybody who wants to join that, they can you'll also be able to find information about that on our Facebook page and our website and encourage you to come if you can. Yeah, we'll probably be on the ground there also. Uh, how can people get more information about NIRS? Any other sources? Sure. Well, if you go to our website, which is nirs.org, and there should be um, a thing about it here um, on my background, um, you can sign up for our email list and you know and, and get it and get uh, get alerts to take action and find out about events and other things. But you can also follow us on Facebook and Instagram and the network formerly known as Twitter. Um, and um, and th th those are the best places to get in touch with us. You can always give us a call too. Well, thanks again to Tim Judson, Executive Director of NEARS. Any other final comments for the audience? Uh, no nukes. No mm -hmm. nukes. Thank you. All right. Thanks, Joe. Right. Thanks once again to Tim Judson and his insight into the future of the fight against nuclear energy. Now a quick message from our sponsors. For a Green Future is also brought to you by the Wood County Park District. The Wood County Park District is a natural resources conservation agency. They protect natural spaces, maintain quality green spaces, provide engaging programming, and they teach people to love and respect nature. They also restore wildlife habitats and lead people on outdoor adventures. Wood County Parks protects natural spaces in Wood County for all to enjoy from 8 a.m. to 30 minutes past sunset every day of the year. There are several ways to get a hold of them and find out what's happening. One is to call them at 419-353-1897. Another is to visit their website, www.wcparks.org. The website, again, is at www wcparks.org. They are also available on all social media, Instagram, Facebook, Twitter, and many others. Just search for WC Parks. That's the Wood County Park District, and we're very grateful for their support. All right, Rebecca, I'm eager to hear about the, is it International Green, Pep, Green Stuff Pepper Day, or? It's actually not national or international. It's just Stuffed Green Pepper Day. Uh, because some guy named Bob Matthews in from Rochester, New York says so. Rochester? Yeah, Rochester. Fantastic. Yeah, where all good ideas come from, I guess. Um, according to Gardner's Net article, How to Grow Sweet Peppers in Your Garden, um, they, they are easy to grow and also popular, so people like to grow peppers in general. It takes about 14 to 21 days for the seeds to germinate, uh, so they, it's good to start them indoors before the last uh, 14 to 21 days before the last frost date. Uh, they recommend a germination mat because it's apparently it's hard to make them from the seeds, make them germinate from seeds. Um, then you need to raise the soil temperature to 80 degrees with bottom heat or a heat lamp. Indoors. Yes. 
which I, I realized that information would have been more useful in the spring. Sorry about that. <laughs> <laughs> so, but yeah, um, and according to another article about the six surprising health benefits of green peppers by Jillian Kabbalah in, in Healthline, uh, the rich in vitamin C and B6, also got fiber nutrients, uh, minerals, vitamins. Uh, they help protect the eyes, heart, and gut health. And uh, let's see, bell peppers, Latin, Latin name is capsicum anum. They're actually, they're actually fruit, technically, a berry, I believe. Uh, and uh, So yeah. many vegetables and fruits, quote unquote, are actually variants. Yeah, strange. yeah, it's like whatever we decide to call them, arbitrarily. They come in a lot of colors, including red, yellow, and purple. And uh, greens are generally, are usually un- Okay, I heard conflicting stuff about this. One source that said that green green peppers, bell peppers, are unripe, but then they, there are varieties that stay green when they get ripe, apparently. Um, so yeah, they tend to be less sweet and slightly bitter than your uh, your yellow, purple, red, other, other kinds. They, they have something called pro-vitamin A, which the body can turn into vitamin A, apparently. Wow. It's not actual vitamin A. Then uh, the other things which uh, tend to be in, in stuffed peppers. Uh, rice is the, the seed of a grass species called or- Oriza sativa. Uh, or also Ariza uh, Labarina? Labarina, I think it is. African rice, which is less common. And you've got various wild rices too that's really not the same thing, but they're tasty. Um, the most wi- they're the most widely, rice is the most widely consumed staple food of the world for, for, for over the half of the world population, especially Af- Asia and Africa. Uh, it's the third highest wor- worldwide production of an agricultural commodity for a- after sugarcane and maize. But a lot of the sugarcane and maize is not used for directly for food purposes. So it's right. really kind of the Animal most seed. important, right? Yeah. Um, so it provides over one fifth of the calories consumed worldwide by humans, which is crazy. Then you have tomatoes, which are also a berry. <laughs> um, in the Solana, the name is Solanum lycopersicum. Lycopersicum. Yeah. So they're uh, they're both that and the um, I believe the bell peppers are big. peppers of various kinds are both in the in the nightshade family. Uh, tomatoes originated in South America, Mexico, and Central America. Tomato is an Aguatl word. Um, the Aztecs, uh, they, the Spaniards got tomatoes from the Aztecs and they spread worldwide in the 1500s. Uh, they're from the Sol- Solan- Solanidae family, Solanidae, the nightshades, including tomato, potato, eggplant, bell peppers, and chilies. Uh, they're, they're popularly said to have an umami flavor, and they're, uh, which means meaty and savory and kind of just generally deepens flavor, yeah. is what people say about that. And then a lot of people uh, use ground beef also in these, in, uh, in stuffed peppers, um, which cattle being a, a domesticated large bovid ungulate. Uh, of course. Yes, there we are, yes. The most common, one of the common varieties is Boss Taurus, or it's considered to be the type species. Uh, it's the most widespread species in the genus. Most breeds originated from extinct aurochs, although not all of them apparently. Um, the genus includes yaks, bison, wisent, whatever that is, and others. Wisent. Wisent, I don't know. <laughs> I'd like to know now, actually. It just doesn't come up in everyday conversation very much, where I'm from anyway. Um, mature animals are called cows and bulls. Uh, the young ones are called heifers and bullocks. And neuter males are called steers or also cows. Uh, they're in the bovid family. And they're used for beef, veal, dairy, hides, riding and graft animals, and dung. And also, they, they have religious significance in a lot of cultures. Um, types of cattle, let's see. There are taurine cattle, which are in Europe and temperate Asia, uh, the Americas and the Australias. Uh, zebus, which are in India and tropical Asia, America and Australia and Sangha, which are sub-Saharan Africa. And, uh, oh yeah, um, 
They're also getting popular as pets, miniature miniature zoo cows. cows. Yeah. That's. I've seen the YouTube videos. They're so cute. <laughs> I guess if they're miniature, they would be just as large as large dogs or something like that. Yeah, yeah. A lot of them just will run around with your dogs cool. and do everything to bark. You know, they they just make <laughs> they friends will. with their yeah. <laughs> so yeah, so. So is that the traditional stuffing for a stuffed green pepper? Is rice, beef, and tomato? That's kind of what I think about. I think so. Okay, apparently what happened was that uh, the Spaniards got the tomatoes from the Aztecs, spread them around the world. Actual green peppers were, uh, that, that variety was bred in Hungary. Uh -huh. And then what's interesting, though, is that um, most vegetarian and vegan varieties of green peppers tend to, or stuffed peppers tend to put... You know, just, so it's not just rice in there, you know, they'll, they'll throw in some uh, little, little, you know, some beans, some black beans or pinto beans and uh, kind of southwestern it up, you know, yeah, uh, maybe put true. in some fake vegan cheese or real cheese if you're a vegetarian and, and throw in some cumin, uh, cilantro, a little corn. So it's kind of like they're coming back to their roots as a, as a new world of food, <laughs> kind of. Also sacred in Jainism, Sikhism, Buddhism. African paganism, ancient Egypt, uh, Greece, Israel, and Rome. Uh, cows and bulls had significant religious uh, significance. Um, they're usually seen as emblems of nurturing and fertility. And and yeah, the Egyptians. What the, it wasn't Hathor. Hathor was the goddess of, of beauty and pleasure too. Sounds good uh, to me. Yeah. Well, you know, cows are pretty if you look at them. They got real nice eyes. Yeah. You know? <laughs> Uh, yeah, so they, they've done a lot for us over the course of human history. <laughs> well, thanks, Rebecca, for that. Uh, another insight as to how the world is all interconnected. And now it's time to take a deeper look at that world with our ecological news segment. For our first story, we travel to Washington, D.C., where some very shady political lobbying by the nuclear industry has resulted in a very bad policy decision getting through the Senate. The Price-Anderson Nuclear Industries Indemnity Act, or just Price-Anderson for short, is a law that limits the liability nuclear plant owners have in case of a nuclear plant meltdown or other accident. It was created back in 1957 to calm the fears of corporations that were afraid of this dangerous new technology. It was supposed to sunset after 20 years, once the industry had proven itself safe and dependable. Instead, the opposite happened. There were several major accidents and partial meltdowns, proving that nukes were just as risky as the insurance companies feared. To this day, homeowners' policies will not cover property lost to nuclear plant accidents. The law says that nuclear companies only have to carry liability for $15 billion. After that, the U.S. tax paper will be forced to cover any costs. The experience of the, the Fukushima disaster demonstrated that this is not even 10% of the damages a meltdown at a U.S. nuclear plant would cause. The act is due to expire this year, and rather than hold hearings or having, have any kind of public discussion, Thanks to nuclear industry lobbyists, the bill has been inserted into the Defense Reauthorization Act. That act passed the Senate with Price Anderson tucked safely and corruptly inside on July 27th. That's according to our friends at Beyond Nuclear in an August 24th report entitled Senate Extends Nuclear Industries Limited Liability to Catastrophic Accidents. What is particularly notable is that this indemnity has been extended to include so-called next-generation nuclear plants, including sodium-cooled plants and so-called SMRs, or small modular reactors, many of which make the claim that they are so safe they can't melt down or have catastrophic accidents. If that were true, we have to ask, then why do they need Price Anderson to continue protecting them? The answer, of course, is that they are lying. The original nuclear plant designs back in the 1950s also made the same claims that meltdowns were impossible. They were lying then, they continue to lie now. The bill has yet to pass the U.S. House 
anti-nuclear activists are pushing for public hearings and public comments on the Price-Anderson renewable, renewal. They say the U.S. should try to maintain at least the appearance of a democracy instead of just letting nuclear industry lobbyists dictate our policies. Now a short but happier update on another nuclear-related story. Back in September 2021, the state of Texas questioned the authority of the Nuclear Regulatory Commission in regards to allowing private companies to store spent nuclear fuel at off-site facilities. As of September 28th of this year, that court case, Texas v. NRC, has been found in favor of Texas, that is to say, and paraphrasing from the judgment papers, the Atomic Energy Act does not grant the Commission the power to issue licenses for private parties to store nuclear fuel, and the Nuclear Waste Policy Act already provides the guidelines for doing so. Therefore, this is yet another misstep and breach of authority by the NRC as to the handling of nuclear waste and the industry at large. This is a win not only for the state of Texas, which banned the storage of high-level nuclear waste with HB7 back in 2021, but also the public, which has had their boundaries continually infringed upon by the actions and policies of the NRC. From Texas, we go to South America for a very uplifting story. The citizens of Ecuador have passed a referendum to ban oil drilling and mining in large parts of the Amazon, reports, reports Reuters.com and others. This is a huge victory for the environment, of course, but also an intensely personal one with the native Warani, Tageri, and Taromenani peoples, now protected from greed-driven incursions onto their territories. The largest area of land so protected is the Yasuni Amazon Reserve, where some of those indigenous populations still live in no-contact, voluntary isolation. The other major area is the Choco Andino Forest, and, measured together, means that 1.5% of the entire Amazon is now permanently protected from oil drilling thanks to the citizens of Ecuador. The measure was overwhelmingly popular, passing by 59% and 68%, respectively. The detractors of the policy, including Petro Ecuador, the company directly affected, worry that the loss in profits will harm the country's economic growth over the next three years or so. But to that claim, we echo the sentiments of Kevin Koenig of the Amazon Watch Advocacy Group that the era of unchecked resource extraction is at an end, unquote. This dirty money should never have entered the global economy at all and is a direct result of companies choosing short-term monetary gains over the planet. Untold and immeasurable harm has already been done by the oil so far extracted, not only to the environment, but also to the humans living closest to the operations. So you'll have to forgive us by celebrating this victory, even at the cost of profits. Our next story features penguins, unfortunately not in a good way. A report published on Nature.com analyzed the breeding seasons of emperor penguins from 2018 until the spring of 2022, and it is not looking good. Five colonies of between 600 and 3,500 mating pairs were observed in the Bellingshausen Sea region, located on the coast of Antarctica directly south of South America, and four out of those five experienced a total breeding ground failure. Flat and stable areas of sea ice are important for the penguins' reproductive efforts, but the research and corresponding satellite imagery has confirmed the sea ice broke up much earlier than expected in 2022. Penguin chicks don't develop waterproof feathers until they become independent after about six months of age, so all of these babies affected were lost. This is unprecedented, said Dr. Peter Fretwell, the co-author of the study, in interviews. Much smaller breeding failures have been recorded, but at a much more dispersed and uncommon rate. This failure of the Arctic ice encompasses a much larger area than previously thought possible, covering 1,500 kilometers of coast, 
and provides some grim evidence for the theory that 90% of emperor penguins will die off by the year 2100 because of loss of habitat. So far, about 30% of the 62 known emperor penguin colonies have been affected by sea ice loss since 2018. And that trend is certain, certainly on track to continue. The sea ice levels so far recorded in 2023 lie about 10% lower than the lowest in the past 40 years. One theory for this is the increasingly warm ocean water temperatures that continue to climb, producing anomalous ocean currents that will soon become the norm. Scientists previously had hope that the Antarctic was more re resistant to changes in climate, but the fact is it just took a little longer to get there. There isn't much hope in the short term for these penguins, as Dr. Fretwell concludes. Quote, We know this will get worse before it gets better. This is the trajectory that we are on. It's only by changing our end behavior and the amounts of fossil fuels we use that we will reverse the trajectory for these emperor penguins and many other species. How bad it gets is still up to us. End quote. So next time you consider driving somewhere instead of walking, or opposing cleaner energy solutions, we urge you to think of the penguins. Our flagship story this episode is actually quite literal. The Norwegian cruise line company Hurtigruten recently revealed its plans for a zero emission ship. It will run on all electric power and use retractable sails covered in solar panels to accumulate energy. The sails hopefully herald a return to more traditional ship propulsion methods. It will feature 60 megawatt hour battery packs for power outside of its peak hours, but during the Norwegian summertime will be generating power from its solar panels for 24 hours a day. The company is also researching ways to reduce hotel operation energy usages. One planned method is for their app to inform each passenger of their usage and the total energy flow of the ship. I can tell you from experience that would be effective. Our array of solar panels came with a similar phone app, and it's really incredible what you can realize from just a monitoring system. The cruise ship, tentatively named C0, is planned to launch in 2030, but entertainment isn't the only sector attempting a return to wind power. The ship Pisix Pisix Ocean by the company Cargill is testing a technology called Wind Wings right now on a journey between China and Brazil. The company claims that a cargo ship could save 1.5 tons of fuel per wing per day and possibly up to as much as 30% savings over its lifetime. Similar routes are being explored for the maritime industry as a whole hopefully marking a large-scale return to wind power, low-emission vessels. Well, that, that'll do it for us here on For a Green Future. We hope you enjoyed our show. Tune in next week when we talk more about the ecology and how it affects you. A quick note before we go, due to a station scheduling error, this show did not air at, on 100.7 FM on Sunday, August 27th as it should have. Don't worry, though, we'll be back on the air next week, 10 a.m. on September 3rd. I don't want no oil A spoil in my shoreline I like fish much better than crud I like birds and things a creeping and crawling won't trade no more oil for blood. The sun don't give us all we need to make this country run. But that black demon oil's got us fussing and fighting, and I do believe it's time we was done. I don't want them nukes run by them kooks who think radioactivity is fun. No more three-headed frogs or kids with leukemia. Nuclear power ain't fit for a dog.
the sun. 